Hello everyone! Welcome to Social Studies with Miss Rogers, World History Edition. We've seen throughout much of our class recently that due to many different scenarios, people have been losing faith in the church, more specifically the Roman Catholic Church. I want to remind you that just because people are losing faith in the church does not necessarily mean they're losing faith in Christianity, but losing faith in how the church is representing Christianity. This will lead to an event called the Protestant Reformation. I know not all students who learn about the Reformation class are Christian, so I just want to point out that Christianity is the dominant religion in Europe at this time, and Europe is what our state standards say we need to focus on. And whether you are religious or not religious, in history, religion can tell us a lot about why people do the things that they do, whether it be the priorities society has, the celebrations and festivals they put on, the social classes, even the wars that are started. So major events such as the Reformation really tell us a lot about the lenses people in society view the world from. So let's get started. During the Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic Church became the dominant form of Christianity in the world. Yes, there were other types, such as the Eastern Orthodox Church, and we haven't talked about it much, but there was the Egyptian Coptic Church, but the Roman Catholic Church was by far the largest and most powerful denomination of Christianity. We know that after the fall of Rome, the Church provided Europe with unified leadership and a sense of normalcy. The church provided social programs and services throughout Europe, and the church was present during the most important moments in people's lives, such as officiating weddings, praying with people as they died, funerals, babies' baptisms, and religion became the center of most people's lives. As the Middle Ages went on, we saw numerous instances where the church did not have the best performance, such as the Crusades, the Great Schism, and the inability to help during the Black Plague, and this will create doubts that people have about the church. People will question whether the church has become too interested in worldly things like money and power, and these doubts will only grow as the printing press is able to print these criticisms and spread them around Europe. To begin, it probably would be a good idea to make sure you know what a reformation is. And a reformation is just a movement of religious reform, which you might have guessed because the term reform is in the word reformation. And another thing, before we get started, the Renaissance and the Reformation were happening at the same time. It's not that the Renaissance happened and then the Reformation happened. The Renaissance is the time period, and the Reformation is an event within said time period. So there will be some concepts and situations that we talked about in our Renaissance class that will be repeated today. Kind of like during the Middle Ages, how we had things going on in Africa and Asia and the Middle East and Europe all at the same time, but this is all just happening in Europe, so hopefully it's a little bit more manageable mentally. Throughout the Middle Ages, we've already seen both social and political factors that would contribute to the Reformation. We've been talking about them constantly, like the Pope declaring supremacy over kings, various events that make people question and criticize the church, the printing press spreading these ideas. There is also going to be a rise of citizens in various kingdoms seeing the Pope as a foreign ruler thinking, uh, why are you all the way over there telling me how to live my life? You're not even a part of our country. People have come to expect more from the church, from the Pope, and seeing such religious figures participate in worldly things like marrying and wanting expensive things, craving power, they believed that those a part of the church were being hypocritical. On top of that, remember when we learned about the Renaissance and we talked about how the church became a patron of the arts? They built St. Peter's Basilica, the Sistine Chapel, any idea how those things were paid for? The church started selling something called indulgences. According to the church, indulgences were something people could buy that would pardon someone of their sins. On paper, the idea of indulgences were not supposed to replace God's right to judge, but the way they were presented to the public really made them seem like get out of hell free cards. And this upset many people, including a man named Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a law student. His parents were so proud, but he was not too thrilled about it himself. He did get his law degree, but afterwards he became a devout monk. Luther became very concerned about corruption in the church. For starters, the church preached that both good works and faith would get you into heaven, 
But Luther saw the idea of good works getting you into heaven as a form of bribery. He believed that faith alone should be enough. However, those ideas went against the preachings of the Pope, and there is a word for that. Heresy. And you could get burned at the stake for heresy or for being a heretic, so it was not safe for him to publicly announce this thought process. In addition to these thoughts, when he visited Rome, he saw prostitutes just casually in the streets, and priests who did not take their church services seriously, and he became very frustrated. For the record, Luther was not the only one frustrated. Types of indulgences had been around since the 11th century, but in order to rebuild specifically St. Peter's Basilica, the Pope created a special kind of indulgence where you could save a family member's soul from purgatory with your money, and many people in society saw this as a kind of blackmail. When Luther was teaching scripture in Wittenberg, there was a friar named John Tetzel who was selling these indulgences, and hearing John Tetzel try to force people to buy these indulgences was really Luther's breaking point. Luther wrote 95 theses criticizing the church's actions, especially the indulgences, and in a dramatic flair, nailed these documents to the door of the church in Wittenberg. So you know, next time you want to call Miss Rogers dramatic, just remember, it could be worse. Also, not gonna lie, every year I teach about Martin Luther and his 95 theses, I for some reason always think of Professor Umbridge from Harry Potter in her wall of rules. God, I hate that woman. But by nailing these theses to the door, he made his criticisms of the church very public for other men of the cloth to see. The thing is though, Luther wrote these criticisms in Latin, which was the formal language within the church. Very early on, for the most part, only clergymen could read and write in Latin, meaning he wasn't trying to blast the church in front of the whole world. He was just trying to draw attention to some aspects of the church that he desperately thought needed to be reformed. To his surprise, Luther's words were quickly translated to German and spread throughout the lands, something he did not expect to happen. His ideas about reforming the church became quite popular amongst Christian humanists, though many became quite angry with the church and went as far as to call for a revolution, burning papal books and writings in the process. The idea of reforming the church soon morphed into rejecting the church. Just remember, even though people are upset with the church does not mean they're leaving Christianity. They're criticizing how the church is representing Christianity. Hey, you know, we said a long time ago that we were concerned about corruption in the church. Hey, hush up, no one asked you, stay in your corner. The most radical ideas in Luther's theses was the idea that clergymen were just regular human beings who made mistakes sinned like everybody else and did not have divine powers to just wipe away your sins or determine where you go after you die. Martin Luther claimed that faith was all someone needed in order to gain salvation, and you could obtain salvation without a priest interpreting the Bible for you. Originally, the church was the authority. They read the Bible and they told you what it said. But Luther claimed you should be able to do that on your own because it's the word of God that should be considered holy, not the word of priests. This blew up way more than Luther originally thought it would, and it started the historical event that we today refer to as the Reformation. Now, just to be clear, again, Luther was not the first man to criticize the church in this way. There were many other church officials who throughout history claimed, uh, hey guys, maybe this is not the right way to do things. But Luther became so influential simply because of our favorite invention of the time period, the printing press. The printing press ensured that his claims and ideas stretched all throughout Europe. The Pope sent Luther a decree that said, Hey friend, it might be a good idea for you to take back what you said. You wouldn't want to be excommunicated or anything. Luther took the decree and decided to throw a giant bonfire and dramatically burnt the decree as a statement. Again, next time you want to call me dramatic, just remember. The Holy Roman Emperor at the time was Charles V of Spain, who, by the way, was a 19-year-old kid at the time, but he ruled all of this. He demanded that Luther come to a trial at the Diet of Worms to admit his wrongdoings and apologize to the church. Most people assumed that a little monk like Luther would immediately fold when being ordered around by someone like Charles, who, again, 
might have been young, but was extremely powerful at the time. Have we forgotten how sassy Luther is because he thinks the idea of the diet of worms is as silly as you all do? Luther said, you know what? Nah, I'm good. I think I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing. Thanks for the invite, though. The Holy Roman Emperor declared Luther an outlaw and forbid anyone from sheltering or feeding him. But many German princes, such as Frederick the Wise, agreed with Luther and decided to help him anyways. And it only got more radical as it went on. Luther claimed that the Pope was the Antichrist and even drew this caricature of him. Nice. He translated the Bible from Latin to German, the first translation of the Bible that regular common people could read. And this became super popular amongst commoners to translate the Bible into vernacular so that they could also read scripture and make inferences for themselves. There you go, Christian humanists. Common people did try to make this movement about overall equality. Rebelling, revolting, rioting as they burned churches and refused to pay taxes. But this was not the best moves as monarchs crushed these riots. Religious reform was okay in their eyes, but the idea of equality? Oof, not yet, my friends. Monarchs are going to hold on to their crowns for a little bit longer. Even Luther claimed, ooh, yeah, friends, my words are supposed to be about spiritual equality, but that does not mean you're equal to royals. Like, you're still a peasant. Sorry about it. German princes who agreed with Luther protested the Catholic Church, and from it sprung a new denomination, Protestantism. The term Protestant was applied to Christians in Western Europe who were a part of a non-Catholic church. One big impact of Luther giving people the tools to read the Bible themselves and create their own interpretations is that it created the idea of different denominations. Various leaders throughout Europe had their own interpretation of Christianity in the Bible, and that would create a lot of subgroups of Protestantism, which we will end up taking a look at tomorrow. So, I'll see you then.